Hello from Ireland. Uh, first of all, let me start off by thanking all the organisers of the Indiana Green Expo, and in particular, Dr. Aaron Patton, for inviting me to present uh, today. Now, unfortunately, I, know, I only know three things about Indiana. One is the obviously the Indianapolis 500. I know about Gary, Indiana, because of the Jackson 5. And a friend of ours lives there, uh, Lou Sharp. So, hello, Lou. Anyway, hopefully we'll get to visit someday, but in the meantime, we'll have to crack on with this virtual visit. Now, I was asked to talk about phosphite, which is great because um, I've done a lot of work with it over the years. And actually, I haven't done a, a talk specifically on phosphite for about two years now. Uh, the last time was up in Quebec, and uh, that went on for about five, five hours. But uh, you know, don't panic, this is only for 30 minutes. So today's talk is on phosphate in turf grass and I'll be covering these points here. I want to talk about the, what it is actually, its history and its usage in turf grass. I want to show some field trial results showing how effective it can be actually in reducing uh, disease incidence. But I want to really show some interesting work as to how it actually uh, suppresses disease. And we'll be looking at some in vitro work showing the effects of phosphate on the growth and development of Microdochium nevale. And some really interesting stuff, I think, anyway, as how phosphite can actually prime or enhance defense mechanisms in turf grass prior to infection. And then we'll branch out and we'll have a look at what actually happens when you apply phosphite to your turf grass, how it's taken up, how it translocates through the plant, and how long it lasts there. And then finally, I want to show some work we did on the effects of phosphite on the growth and development of a couple of turf grass species. So that's the plan. What exactly is phosphite? Well, it's a form of phosphorus, which as everyone knows is a major plant nutrient required for numerous uh, metabolic processes within the plant. Now, phosphorus is taken up in the form of phosphate, which is derived from phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. Now, phosphite, on the other hand, while very similar, is derived from phosphorus acid, which is H3PO3. And here's the very basic uh, molecule of phosphate here on the left, PO4, phosphorus with four atoms of uh, oxygen. And it's in this form that uh, various enzymes will interact with it and take it into the plant for all these various metabolic processes. Now phosphite, as you can see here on the right, is a phosphorus uh, atom with four, sorry, with three uh, atoms of, of oxygen, PO3. And because of this actual missing atom of oxygen, it can't be incorporated into these metabolic processes. So phosphite actually can't be used as a f source of, of phosphorus nutrition. And we'll come back to that later on. So as I said, you know, uh, phosphite is derived from phosphorus acid, which has the pH of about 2.2. So it has to be modified, first of all, before it can be used in plants. And usually an alkali salt is used. Now, back in the 80s, the very first formulation of, of phosphorus acid used was actually interacted with aluminum salts. And we had the product phosphatilal, which was, I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And then it was in the 1990s when it was then interacted with uh, potassium hydroxide. And this forms potassium uh, phosphate, basically. So, so it's the interaction of phosphorus acid and potassium hydroxide, which gives a fairly neutral pH and potassium phosphate, which can actually be used in plants. Now, it can be interacted with other alkali products as well. And you can have ammonium hydroxide, for example, can be used, or you can have magnesium phosphates, calcium phosphates. But I think the most common now would be potassium phosphate for turf grass at the moment anyway. So what exactly is uh, phosphate used for? Well, go, going back to the 1980s, it was found to be very effective at suppressing a couple of very dangerous pathogens in many plant species, uh, particularly um, Pythium and Phytophthora. Now, it's been used since the 1980s in turf grass to, to, to reduce uh, or suppress Pythium in the United States and countries with similar uh, climatic conditions. Uh, Pythium is not something that we have to deal with over here in, in, in Ireland and in the UK. Again, we just don't have the weather for it. So we didn't actually get to use phosphate until about um, 2004, when a couple of um, 
agronomists and some companies started promoting phosphate use, saying that it would suppress Mycodochium nivale, or Fusarium patch disease. Now, so you might think, well, you know, if phosphate is so effective against Pythium and Phytophthora, it would be effective maybe against other fungal pathogens. But of course, these aren't fungi, uh, they're omicetes. So you couldn't say that uh, with any sort of certainty that it would be effective. Now, there was some research uh, around 2004, 2005, showing phosphate to be effective at reducing anthracnose, and some work uh, with cereals looking at Mycodogium mages. But again, this is around 15 years ago. There was no actual solid research into phosphate effects on Mycodogium nivale and turf grass, which was great because that's the time when I started looking into it. So the, uh, the field was wide open, you could say. So this is the effect of uh, potassium phosphate on uh, pythium in turf grass. Now, as you can see here, this is the level in on the control plots, and this is the effect potassium phosphate had on disease levels. But you can see potassium phosphate uh, very effective at reducing or controlling uh, pythium. I'm sure everyone's probably familiar with that at this stage. Now this is the effect of phosphate actually on anthracnose. This is from Rutgers University on a Poa annua putting green in 2008. And here you can see the level of disease on the control plots on the bottom here. This is the phosphate on its own here. And this is the uh, fungicide uh, treatment here. You can see the phosphate very effective at reducing uh, anthracnose. But interestingly, the combination of uh, phosphate and the fungicide here, very effective. And it's this uh, com interaction of different uh, compounds have different uh, suppression effects on uh, the disease. And you see this quite often. So this is some more recent work. This is some work I did in 2018, which is what, three years ago, I suppose now. So what we had here is, uh, this was done at the, at the Curra trial plots where I was uh, superintendent. So we had, uh, we had a number of, of uh, treatments going out. We had untreated control. We had a phosphate here. And we had a combination of various uh, nutritional inputs. And we had uh, Banamax, which is a uh, propiconazole. Uh, this has since been banned over here. So what we found was from these treatments, they ran from uh, July to October, 2018. Treatments applied every 14 days and we looked at disease incident weekly. We also looked at, looked at turf quality. So what we found from that particular uh, series of, of trials was this was at the peak of anthracnose incidents in uh, August, 2018. And you can see the level of anthracnose here on the control plots uh, and uh, the phosphate treatment on its own, very effective, as you can see, uh, went from 35.6% down to 11%. So pleased with that. The, uh, on a side note, apart from phosphate, uh, this combination of various nutrients, including phosphate, uh, were very effective at controlling disease with NP and K, calcium, sulfur, copper, salicylic acid and silica in that various uh, treatment program. That was as effective as the Banner Max, in fact, as the controlling anthracnose. But again, it's the phosphate we're concentrating on today. So a phosphate quite effective there at reducing anthracnose. So we also looked at uh, phosphate and microdochium. And this is from some trials we did back in 2010 to 2014. So we ran these trials from September to March each year, and we had phosphate applied on its own or in combinations with fungicides and various biostimulants. And we had three turf grass species. We had uh, velvet bent, we had creeping bent, and poa annua. And we looked at disease incidence every month, and we also looked at turf quality. So this is what we found. Uh, this is the sort of the the mean values of the four years of trials. And what you can see over here on the right is the control levels uh, of the three species. This is the uh, Poa annua, this is velvet bent and creeping bent levels. So what we found over the four years was that uh, phosphate, potassium phosphate applies sequentially 
It was very successful. It, it reduced disease incidence by about 50% uh, in all cases. Uh, the fungicides here, which we use, which are iprodione and chlorothalonil. Again, both of these have been banned now since. <clears throat> they were quite effective. But again, as you can note, the combination of phosphate and fungicides in, in most cases was very effective at controlling disease. So phosphate over here, about a 50% reduction on mycodokium over the four years. As I said, we also looked at turf quality over the years. And this was a surprising result that we got here because we found any treatment that had uh, phosphate uh, contained within it, the turf quality was improved, uh, better density, better color. Uh, so that was interesting and you know we used to have green keepers coming in from around Ireland and from the UK and even when there was no disease uh, evident they could pick out the uh, phosphate treated plots from the actual quality of them or <coughs> compared to the controls. Uh, this is a more recent uh, research I've done looking at suppression of microdocium. Now you probably copped on by now after I mentioned all these fungicides that have been banned over here in Europe, there are some pretty severe restrictions on fungicide availability, which is why we have to look at all sorts of alternative ways to reduce disease. So this was a trial uh, from 2018-2019. Again, we're looking at a, a range of inputs here to uh, reduce microdogium. Untreated control with the phosphate here on its own, and then a combination of products as well, and in strata. Again, this was available then, but since has been uh, banned. So these treatments ran from September 2018. This, this particular uh, series went, went from September to January 2019, uh, every 14 days, and again we looked at disease incidence. So this is what we found with that particular series of, of uh, trials. As you can see here on the uh, on the right, this is the control level, uh, 54%. The phosphate again was performed very well, it reduced the disease incidence down to 22%. So very pleased with that. The cocktail of various uh, nutritional inputs were, was effective, reduced the disease levels further, but not statistically different. And again, the instrata, which uh, performed very well, which again has been has, has gone off the market now. So uh, what we then did uh, for the final part of that particular series from, from January to March 2019, we went with the same products and same compounds here, but we also included a chelated iron into the program. Now this uh, sort of rearing off from phosphate use, but I thought it would be interesting to see. And what you can see again is uh, while the, the disease levels were slightly lower during this period, uh, phosphate again very effective. Uh, statistically, the inclusion of the chelated iron actually re reduced the uh, disease levels further. But again, like we're going to concentrate on phosphate today, and you see 40, 41% in the control, 17% from phosphate inputs. So again, pleased with that. Now, obviously, a lot of these uh, inputs and results we're looking at, they wouldn't actually be acceptable uh, disease levels, which is why you know we're looking at a whole range of methodologies, including uh, cultural practices to further reduce disease. But again, we're just concentrating on phosphate today. Again, it's not just myself that's um, looking at microdokium and phosphate, quite a few others. Now, this is Dr. Clint Maddox from over in Oregon State University. And uh, for the past few years now, he's been looking at managing uh, microdokium, looking at a whole range of cultural and nutritional inputs uh, with great success. So he also looked at phosphate and got some pretty interesting results also. Here's a snapshot of some of the work here that uh, Clint has done. On the left here is a control plot, fairly devastated with microdogium. Nice, nice photo there. And on the right here, you can see the effect of phosphate, sulfur, iron, and some pigment had. Some really good results there. Like I say, it has some very good results over the years using just phosphate in reducing microdogium. So what we can say from our various years of research and trials is that sequential applications of phosphate will actually significantly reduce microdokium de valley incidence and anthracnose. And 
uh, a combination of phosphate with various fungicides will act, act uh, synergistically to enhance the fungicide disease suppression. And as we've seen, we'll have significant improvement in turf grass quality also. So, you know, most of those trials you saw were carried out while I was as a superintendent at the Royal Coral Golf Club. And, you know, applying sprays and carrying out field trials for a superintendent was fairly much straightforward enough. I had the land there to spare and applying sprays was pretty much an everyday occurrence, as with most superintendents. But unfortunately, they don't give out a PhD just for carrying out field trials. So we had to delve further and deeper into what was going on, actually. And we had to try to figure out what was the means of suppression. In other words, did phosphite act directly on the fungus? Was it uh, acting as a fungicide and inhib inhibiting the pathogen? Or was it working indirectly? Was it working on the plant to stimulate defense mechanisms? Or indeed, was it a combination of both? So we had to set out and do some various lab work to try to figure out exactly what was going on. So here's one thing that we did. We wanted to see the effect, if any, that phosphate had actually on the mycelial growth of Microdochium nivale. So what we did was we collected our various samples of Microdochium from a range of uh, turf infected turf grasses. We grew them on PDA on dishes, and we amended these uh, this PDA with a whole range of different concentrations of phosphate and potassium hydroxide and phosphate, and we looked at the effect this had on the actual growth of the of the fungus. So we had loads of plates uh, of the a series of months uh, which we grew the microdochium on so you know the PDA was amended to various concentrations and this is what we found so this is showing the effect the various concentrations of these compounds here on the bottom had on the mycelial growth of microdochium and as you can see here where the the laser is at 100 micrograms per milliliter the various phosphate concentrations actually almost fully inhibited the growth this actually gives a better, clearer uh, idea of what was going on. This is something we presented at the um, European Turfgrass Society back in oh, 2012, it's about nine years ago almost. But what you're seeing here is uh, this bottom line here, this red line here, is the effect on growth that potassium phosphate had. Uh, it actually didn't inhibit the growth at all. But as the concentrations of, of potassium phosphate increased in the growth media, as you see, as it got up to 100 micrograms per milliliter, there was almost full uh, inhibition of growth. Now, we did some other work, uh, which we're not showing today, but it didn't actually kill the fungus. It just slowed or inhibited the growth of it. And this is a clear visual of uh, actually what was going on. Uh, as you can see here, this would, would have inoculated these plates on day one with a piece of inoculum here in the center of the plate. And after four days, on the phosphate uh, in amended plate, you can see that it had almost grown out to the edge. Again, on the control, it had grown out almost fully to the edge. Whereas the phosphate amended growth media, the microdochium hadn't grown at all, really. As I say, it didn't kill it, but it certainly significantly reduced the growth of it. And this is a closer look of what was going on again. Over here on the left is the individual strands of Microdochium hyphae growing on the unamended uh, control plates. Whereas in the presence of phosphate, uh, it was, uh, it, the phosphate was actually impeding the uptake and metabolism of phosphate and was causing this stunting and this disruption of, of growth here and stressing the fungus also. And we actually uh, published that in vitro work a couple of years ago in uh, plant pathology. And what we surmised was, not surmised, what we summarized was that phosphate will actually inhibit the mycelial growth and the conidial germination of microdochium. It also disrupts the hyphal morphology and it causes the release of stress metabolites. So what does that mean in the plant? Well, you know, if phosphate is taken into the plant and the microdochium infects, it will actually slow the growth of the pathogen in the plant. And this would allow the for faster recognition and a quicker response by the plant. So the defense mechanisms could kick in quicker and thereby reduce uh, infection levels. So I just mentioned um, defense mechanisms. 
and you know plant defenses are very involved and complex and, and certainly we don't have time today to get too deeply into that but it involves uh, first of all recognition of the plant being infected and then the short-term uh, responses look such as hypersensitive response and program cell death uh, production of various antimicrobial compounds such as pathogenesis related proteins and phytoalaxins but then there's a more long-term whole plant response such as systemic acquired resistance and induced systemic resistances whereby infected plants can signal to other parts of the plants uh, to in, induce these defense proteins uh, so this involves a production of a whole range of compounds uh, a lot of these can be grouped as phenotic compounds and of course the question we had was you know can phosphite treatment actually enhance or stimulate these defense responses so I mentioned um, the you know phenolic compounds, and this is the wide range of compounds produced in plants. They're mostly what's called secondary metabolites, so they're not required for main metabolism and day-to-day -day growth, but they are produced enough for a whole range of responses to both abiotic and biotic stress. And what we wanted to look at was whether uh, microdocum infected plants showed any differences compared to uninfected plants. So we did a three-year study. Uh, this actually was in the uh, greenhouse turf grass we had. We also did a field trials. But as you can see here, the blue levels here are, are actually phenolic levels in uninfected plants. This is Poa annua, and the same, the uninfected levels here in uh, Agrostis solanifera. But with the infected plants, as you can see in the red, they had elevated of these total phenolic compounds in them, which indicates that, you know, yes, in turf grass, uh, increased phenolic compounds are as a response to stress. So, uh, you know, following on from that, we actually wanted to see whether phosphate pretreatment had any effect on these total phenolic compounds in turf grasses. So we looked at two turf grass species and we applied phosphate, potassium phosphate. We also applied potassium phosphate and water as a control over six months sequentially and this is what we found this is poa annua and the bottom one here is a uh, creeping bent so you can see the level of these defense related compounds here in the blue in the control ones which only received distilled water the phosphate treated uh, plants had some effect but there was a, a significant uh, increase in the level of these defense related compounds in the phosphate treated plants so this was shown that you know pre-treatment sequentially treatments of phosphate over six months actually led to an enhancement of these defense compounds so then we moved into look into the greenhouse and we looked at the levels of phenolic compounds in inoculated turf grasses so this is actually poa annua so we would have inoculated the uh, microdocum here uh, towards day zero and as the, the uh, disease uh, progressed we took samples and we looked at the levels of these phenolic compounds and as you can see the phosphate pretreated plants had much more rapid and much greater accumulations of these compounds compared to the controls and phosphate again it was the same with the uh, creeping bent here similar higher levels uh, from phosphate pretreatment and if we looked at the disease centers and the amount of disease incidence the phosphate treated plants which had the higher levels of disease of uh, phenolic compounds had lower levels of disease incidence so what we concluded from that piece of work was that you know phenolic compounds are a major component of turf grass defense responses and that phosphate pretreatment actually led to enhanced and more rapid uh, production of these compounds and therefore le lower levels of microdocum incidence in all these uh, turf grass samples that we looked at so like you know so far we've seen you know phosphate in the field will reduce microdocum and anthracnose we know from the lab work that it actually inter interferes with the growth of microdocum and that phosphate pretreatment will actually enhance or stimulate these defense compounds so you know what else is going on and so I was asked this question at the university as you get yeah, you know you get asked a lot of questions going through university what happens when you apply phosphate to the leaf is it taken up is it assimilated into the plants so what exactly happens so we had what we had to do was to try to figure out a way to measure uh, how phosphate was taken in uh, did it translocate uh, where did it accumulate 
Uh, and that was the plan. So what we had to do then was figure out a way to separate and measure separately the phosphite and the phosphate ion. So we had to turn to a process called high performance ion chromatography. Again, this allowed us to actually separate and, and measure the uh, phosphate and phosphite ions. So the plan was to apply potassium phosphate to our greenhouse samples and then gather the leaf, crown and roots over a six week period and measure the, uh, the accumulations in these tissues. So this is what we found. This is the accumulations over 96 hours following treatment. So we would have started here on the uh, on the left day zero and the within 48 hours in the leaf in both uh, samples, we found accumulations of up to almost 5000 ppm. And interestingly enough, if you look down here, this is showing the phosphate accumulations in the in the in the root. So this is showing that phosphate is actually very mobile within the plant. So that previous chart was over 96 hours. These are the same samples over a six week period following uh, treatment. And as you can see, uh, you know, week one, rapid accumulations up to, uh, this is up to three and a half thousand PPM. And over the six week period, it gradually dropped away in both uh, turf grass species. And what was happening there was in fact that the, the leaf was being removed by cutting. Because other work we did uh, looking at phosphate levels showed no increases at all. So it was showing there was no implant conversion of phosphite to phosphate. So that was, the previous ones were in February with low growth uh, potential. This was another series we did then in uh, July. As you can see, still a rapid accumulation following treatment, but a much more rapid uh, redux reduction in phosphate levels in the leaf. So this was showing that the, the leaf was, the plant was growing faster and the leaf was being removed much more rapidly uh, along with the, with the phosphate. So from the, the work we did in that area, we worked out that, you know, certainly from uh, September through to March, in our climate anyway, a three week uh, window of application would maintain leaf levels of phosphate to an acceptable level that would help to reduce microdochium. So what else can we say about phosphate? So we wanted to see at one stage of our research, you know, what happens when you apply phosphate? Does it actually act as a nutrient source or a biostimulant? Can it provide phosphorus nutrition to turf grass? And what exactly effects can it have on turf grass growth? Now we saw from the field trials earlier on that there's certainly an improvement in turf grass quality. So we devised this experiment in the greenhouse. What we did was we, uh, we had two uh, turf grass species, we had Lodium perenni and Poa annua, and we had them growing in two different types of root zone. We had one which was sufficient in phosphorus, which was uh, 35 to 40 ppm. And the second root zone was deficient. It was only around five ppm of phosphorus in it. So two root zones, two species, uh, three treatments we applied. We had phosphate, KH2PO4. We had phosphite, potassium phosphite. And we provided a control uh, treatment of, of potassium. So there are the three treatments and we wanted to see the effects on growth in areas of shoot development, uh, crowns and roots. So in a nutshell, this is what we found. This is uh, perennial rye and poa annua growing in a phosphorus deficient root zone. So if you look over here uh, on the on the left, you can see the effects on, on leaf growth, certainly on, on both species. And you note the ones that were, were treated with phosphate responded well, there was increase in growth. But if you compare the ones that only received uh, potassium to the ones that received phosphate, you'll see the phosphate in all cases, not only in the leaf, but in the crowns and in the, uh, the roots, the phosphate treated plants uh, grew much worse than those that didn't receive any form of phosphorus whatsoever. So what was happening here is that, you know, all plants in a phosphorus deficient uh, environment will respond with these deficiency responses. They change their root architecture and various other responses to try to extract as much phosphorus as possible. So when you apply phosphite to a P deficient plant, 
It recognizes phosphate as a form of phosphorus, and these deficiency responses will not kick in. So what we're saying here is that by applying phosphate, you're actually doing more harm than good in a, in a P-deficient area. This, on the other hand, is the both perennial ryegrass and poa growing in a phosphorus-sufficient root zone. And again, this was quite surprising because what we saw here was that in both cases, in leaf, crown and roots, the application of phosphate actually enhanced growth in all areas. So we're not sure exactly what went on there, but certainly it was uh, enhancing, the, the presence of phosphate was enhancing the uptake and distribu distribution of various nutrients within the plant and given this positive response in growth. So the summary of that particular branch of the research we did was that, you know, in a P deficient root zone, foliar applied phosphate does not supply a usable form of phosphorus and will actually repress deficiency responses. However, when there's a, there's a sufficient amount of phosphorus in the root zone, phosphate treatment increased the growth in all areas of the plant. And you can see it in the photo here. So this was the plants that received phosphate in a deficient root zone, this is of course. Uh, the control which received no form of phosphorus whatsoever was actually better than the phosphate treated plants. So we're getting towards the end of the talk now. You'll be glad to hear, I'm sure. So let me just give a, give a quick summary of the last 30 minutes. So phosphate, it's a form of phosphorus. It can significantly reduce microdopium and anthracnose infection. It will also enhance the efficacy of turf grass fungicides when used in, in, in a program with them. It will also, uh, we've seen that it inhibits the actual metabolism and growth of my, microdopium nevale. And uh, pre-treatment with phosphate will actually prime and enhance turf grass defense mechanisms. Uh, we've seen that foliar applied phosphate is rapidly taken up and translocated, but does not supply a usable form of phosphorus. And in P deficient root zones, plant deficiency responses uh, were actually repressed by phosphate treatment. But in P-sufficient root zones, phosphate increased uh, growth and biomass within all the treated plants. And we've seen from the various field trials also that phosphate treatment will actually improve turf grass quality. So hopefully uh, you found something of interest in the last half hour. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you have any questions or various uh, responses uh, out there, as you can see. Or there's my email. Again, I'm open to any questions or interactions, no problem whatsoever. And uh, just to say thank you very much for listening. And again, thanks to the Indiana Green Expo and Dr. Patton for actually inviting me. So hopefully you found it of interest and uh, didn't fall asleep halfway through.